Good evening, everyone. I'm Allison Hurst, curator here at The Modern. I'm obviously subbing in for Terry Thornton this evening, who is under the weather. I wanted to welcome you all to Tuesday evenings at The Modern. Tonight is a special presentation and a preview to Focus Herrera Sarkissian, which opens this Friday. And we are lucky to have Herrera here to introduce his work and his trajectory as an artist. Then for the second part of the evening, Herrera and guest curator of the exhibition, Dr. Omar Khalif, will be in conversation about the show. And for a moment of housekeeping, I wanted to remind you all to please silence your phones. Omar Khalif is a writer and curator, and he is the director of collections and senior curator of the Sharjah Art Foundation. He has curated more than 100 exhibitions, special projects, and commissions globally. And here at The Modern, Omar has curated a beautiful and important exhibition, which offers an in-depth look at Herrera's work. Herrera was born in Damascus and now lives in The Hague. In addition to learning a great deal from his father's commercial photo studio, Dream Color, Herrera earned a BFA in photography at the Gerrit Rietveld Academy in Amsterdam. His work has been featured in exhibitions around the world at the Tate Modern London, New Museum New York, Mori Art Museum in Tokyo, and the Sharjah Biennial and Istanbul Biennial, to only name a few. We are very honored to have Omar and Herrera here this evening to share their insights in tonight's presentation, Herrera Sarkissian, Syria, Belonging, Not Longing. So please join me in welcoming Herrera Sarkissian. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, first of all, I would like to uh, uh, thank uh, the Museum of Modern Art, uh, Fort Worth, for this uh, generous invitation, and also for Omar for his proposal to show uh, in the museum. Uh, it's it's uh, such an honor to be here, and this is my first time being in the States, uh, and also showing in the States uh, as a <clears throat> like uh, a solo show. Uh, I would like to start uh, <clears throat> present talking up, like from my uh, for of my background where I come, how I started, and I will start with uh, uh, talking about my father's shop, uh, which he named it Dream Color because uh, and the, the shop was opened in 1976. My father was a photographer uh, for 30 years, and. Uh, in the 70s, when uh, color uh, films came uh, on the market, we didn't have the technology in Syria to develop these films, so they had to send uh, all these films to Lebanon. Uh, and it took between five to seven days to get ready, and then they, they had to wait this long time to bring all these films back. So my father's dream was to open a, a color lab which he did in 1976, and that was the first color lab in Syria. Uh, it was a big project, and and actually this lab, it's for uh, it. It was my academy, where I grew up. I spent more time in this lab than home, uh, and where I learned everything photo about photography and other uh, matters in life too. Uh, so what I did is. After I finished uh, high school, I, I just I didn't want to go and study. I just wanted to go and work with my dad, and I I worked there for 12 years. I took over, uh, and after 12 years, I just reached like uh, the end uh, of the ladder because I wanted to do to to do more, and there was no nothing to do more in the lab. So I just decided to leave and become an artist and become a photographer. And that, that's, it's been always my dream, too. Uh, so in, in, in 2008, I had the opportunity to go to, to the Netherlands and do a, a BFA uh, photography at the Academy of Gerrit Rietveld in Amsterdam. And I left the shop, and I went there to study. And for my dad, it, this was a, an issue because there was no one else in the family who wanted to continue the business. I was the only one who, who was designated to take over. Uh, and then he decided to close the shop. 
after 30, uh, 30 years. And uh, so what I had the idea of going back, uh, and this was my graduation project also for the academy. I had the idea of going back to Damascus uh, in 2010 and document the space, the entire lab. It's the place where I grew up and I had memories in each uh, room of the, of the lab. And I documented the lab, uh, took pictures. Uh, this, these machines were all like later because when they made the mini lab uh, were like machines that they can do developing films and printing all in one because before this uh, the older uh, generations were like massive machines so each machine took like a space of 50 square meter. In, in the lab itself we used to develop 2,000 films a day and there were 15 employees, we, that's where we, there were always uh, shifts. And uh, this is my father, and this is, uh, so, <clears throat> and this was, uh, these are portraits of him when he, uh, from his be uh, beginning of his career, when he was 14 years old, when he moved from Aleppo to Damascus. Uh, to learn photography. So what I did in this project, I combined these images with images, uh, photographs of, of me uh, taken by my father for the first time he photographed me in the, in the, in the studio. I asked him to do uh, as a last customer uh, in the shop. So it was com a combination of first generation and last generation because there was no one else to continue, take over. Uh, there is a blood on my neck that was because of the stress when I shaved. <laughs> <laughs> I was so stressed when my, my father was taking pictures of me. The next work is called Execution Squares, which is, which is uh, shown here at the museum. And uh, these are public execution squares. Uh, uh, these squares were inherited from uh, the Ottomans. Uh, they used uh, the Ottomans, uh, they stayed uh, in the region for uh, over 400 years. And they used to execute criminals in the main, on the main square of each city. So uh, in each city in Syria, we had a main square. Uh, of course, every, it is known for everyone uh, which square they used to hang. And this same system, it was inherited by the following uh, governments. The French, when they uh, uh, colonized Syria for 25 years, they used the same squares as well. And then the, fol uh, the following uh, governments. So it, it's not something new that it started. And it's been going on until uh, war uh, uh, took place in 2011. When I was 11 years old uh, on my way to high school, uh, I, it was 6.30 in the morning and I was in the bus and I saw on the way to school, I, I saw three hanged bodies on one of these squares. So they were topless and covered with a uh, piece of paper sheet, white, and on the paper sheet was written uh, the name of the person, the criminal date of birth, and uh, the reason why he was executed. Uh, <clears throat> so there were three, and they, three of them were, uh, their eyes were wide open. And this image, it stayed with me, uh, and every time I passed by, uh, by this square, I always 
just imagine these three bodies were still there, that, that they were never uh, erased from my memory. So I wanted to, with photography, I wanted to take pictures of these squares and try to convince myself that this doesn't exist anymore. But I failed because I couldn't erase this image. Uh, whenever I pass by from these uh, squares, I keep seeing these bodies, these faces. And I think this is also something that uh, each Syrian have experienced. These photos, there are 14 images, 14 squares. Uh, they were photographed in three different cities in, in, in Syria, Damascus, Latakia, and Aleppo. So in, uh, <clears throat> in the 90s, the crime rate really went really high, in, uh, especially in Damascus. And uh, instead of using this one main square, best because they couldn't uh, manage anymore, they started to use the nearest square where the crime took place. So what they did is, uh, in the, uh, at early hours in the morning, four, 4 in the morning, they set up a platform and they do the execution. Uh, it's, it's been always by lynching. And they kept the bodies hanged until 9.30, 10 in the morning so everybody could see. So these photographs, all of them were taken at 4.30 in the morning, the same time when they uh, set these platforms. So this, eventually these uh, squares, they become a, a space for revenge just to show the family who lives nearby that we're, we're uh, <clears throat> taking the revenge. And also it's, it becomes a, a sort of a lesson to show the public that this is what happens if you commit a crime. And usually the crimes were either killing or rape or uh, politicals was, were never uh, executed in public because the moment they were arrested or uh, we never knew anything about them. So the next project is called Last Scene, and these are uh, uh, the last wishes of terminally ill people uh, in the Netherlands. So in the Netherlands, there's an uh, ambulance foundation. It's called uh, Ambulance uh, uh, Stichting Vents, which is like Wish Ambulance Foundation. It was the, <coughs> uh, found, founded by uh, an, an ambulance driver from Rotterdam. And uh, what he did is he created this foundation uh, that is run by 250 uh, uh, nurses from all over Netherlands, volunteers, and also including uh, ambulance drivers, policemen, and fire, uh, firemen. So what this uh, foundation does is they ask uh, people who are uh, terminally ill and at the latest uh, stage of their lives, uh, they ask them what they want to see before they die. And they can bring them wherever they want uh, within Europe, as long as they can drive. Uh, so far, they have done 7,600 wishes, and it's all for free. Uh, for the, it's only for Dutch uh, citizens. So what I did is I selected 47 public locations uh, in the Netherlands. Uh, that were uh, chosen as wishes uh, of s some of these patients, but some of them are also, uh, it's quite common uh, space that people ch keep uh, choosing the same location to go, and some of them has like a private uh, personal story linked to the location. So what I did is with the help of this foundation, I selected 47 locations and I went back uh, to these places uh, on the exact date and time uh, where these patients visited. So each, each, each location has a name of the patient and the date of the, uh, the, vi uh, the date that they visited and also the name of the location as well. It could be a year later or two years. I, I never met the patients because they, they all passed away. 
So some of them, like, they wanted to see this. Uh, the, the guy who wanted to see this, uh, who uh, I think he shut down a MiG-21 uh, Russian airplane or repaired it. Uh, so he wanted to see the... And this woman wanted to see... Uh, she wanted to swim in this swimming pool. Uh, this is the Rijksmuseum in, uh, in Amsterdam. So in, in the museum, there are only two paintings where most of the patients want to see, which is the, the Night Watch of Rembrandt and the Jewish Bride. So these two specific uh, paintings, because they consider these are the best of his works. So what the museum provides is, after they shut down the museum, they allow these patients to come and uh, stay in front of these paintings as long as they want. And all these paintings are in, uh, in bed. They, cannot, they are not in a state that they can walk or uh, do any other phys physical activities. Uh, so th these are like, uh, there are eight trees here, and each tree you can relate to one of these trees uh, according to your date of birth. Retired ship, a chapel, Plane watch uh, spotting from uh, the Schiphol airport. This is a replica of World War I Museum and Frank's uh, house. Uh, this is uh, the person who drove this tram, and this tram is uh, displayed in a museum on this exact same tram. So his wish was to go and drive the tram and they provided, uh, so they brought out the tram and he drove in the park. Seascapes, uh, it's quite common, and the uh, crematorium. Uh, this is one of recent uh, projects I've done with, uh, also with the help of Sharjah Art Foundation. Uh, it's about a bird. Uh, it's called Northern Bald Ibis. Uh, this work also will be shown here at the museum. Uh, the bird is 5,200 years old. Uh, the Egyptians they uh, called it. The, uh, they had the body. One of the gods were uh, god of Thoth which is the god of wisdom and writing, uh, the human body and the head of the bird. So it's the, they had the eastern uh, uh, bald ibis, and in Syria it existed northern bald ibis. So in Egypt it, was, it had white feather and black head, and in Syria the east, it's this version, black feather and red uh, head. And it was also mentioned in the Old Testament as the fertility messenger. And also in the region, in the Middle East, uh, uh, the people in uh, uh, <clears throat> the Muslim people, when they went to pilgrimage, they used uh, this bird as a guide. They followed the bird, because when these birds immigrated uh, from Syria all the way to uh, Ethiopia, the first stop was station was in Saudi Arabia. So they went. They followed the bird to go, to go to Mecca. This bird existed in, in, in Palmyra, uh, which is like in the middle of Syria. And Palmyra is one of the oldest civilizations also that, uh, in Syria. And the, so the, the bird existed in Palmyra until the 30s, and it disappeared. And the Syrian government confirmed the extinction of this bird in uh, late 80s. So what happened in 2002, they found uh, a colony of uh, seven birds nesting in Palmyra. The Bedouins found uh, this colony, and they, uh, they informed the government, but the government uh, thought it was an uh, anecdote, so they didn't follow up until uh, an Italian biologist heard about this. Uh, his name is Gianluca Serra. He flew all the way to Palmyra, and he... He lived in Palmyra for nine years to study these birds. So among these seven birds, there was one female bird uh, who knew the migratory route from uh, Palmyra all the way to Ethiopia. And they named her uh, Zenubia after the name of the queen of Palmyra. 
Gianluca Serra, with the help of the first Syrian lady, they built a, a breeding center in Palmyra and they started to make more uh, babies. So uh, these birds used to uh, migrate summertime and the whole journey took uh, six, six months. So the first station, they, they crossed uh, over seven to eight countries during the, the journey. So the first stop was always Saudi Arabia and that's where the problems always happened, where the Saudis used to hunt this, uh, Saudi hunters used to hunt these birds. So the, the main reason that these birds were, were get killed uh, was because of hunting and then second was because of electricity cables. So the number of these birds uh, increased until they reached 17. Uh, the adults always flew uh, all the way to Ethiopia, but the younger ones, they couldn't fly long distances. So it was, they stationed in Saudi Arabia and back to Palmyra uh, winter time. So what happened during the, the, the years, the number started to uh, decrease again until 2000, uh, 2013, they saw the last three birds out of 17 uh, in Ethiopia. And in 2004, they saw Zenubia, Zenubia for the last time in Palmyra. And the birds uh, is extinct again. So these birds exist in, uh, in Europe, in Italy, Austria, Spain, but they are not migratory. Uh, the ones that are extinct are the migratory one. And now they are, there's a new program to uh, introduce to these birds to migrate and start more uh, to live in the wild. So what I did is I tried to find, uh, because find a skull of this bird, because even the skull is red listed in Europe. Uh, within Europe, it, it, it is not allowed to ship the skull. So eventually, after three months of research, I found out a very small zoo in Granada in Spain where the, the guy, uh, Miguel, who kindly took a picture of a table with 10, I think 15 skulls, and he just said, whatever you want, I'll just send you one. So we, de uh, we did the 3D scan of the skull and we created seven skulls, which how the story started in Palmyra. So th this is the migratory route, and this is what Omar was uh, talking about, the aluminium plate. Uh, it's, uh, it has a relief of the, of the region, and in the middle, which uh, it's the migratory route, which looks like a noose, actually. And this uh, also screenshots from the video. Uh, it's a nine hours video. Uh, it's the journey of the bird from Palmyra all the way to Ethiopia, which uh, recorded on the same height that usually the bird flies and the same uh, view also, the bird view. And the speed as well. So th there is a special uh, internet website uh, where you can enter and you can read all these statistics that was recorded during uh, studying these birds, where, where each one flew, the speed, the height, everything is recorded because all these 17 birds were tagged. And this last, uh, it's an image uh, I found online, was taken by an Italian diplomat uh, who was based in Damascus. And these were the last time that they were seen skies of uh, Palmyra. So the, the last project I will talk about, which is an uh, ongoing project now, uh, it's, uh, it's called Last Scene, and it's about people who are, uh, who are kidnapped during war times. And the families are still looking for answers. Uh, they want to know whether the person is dead or alive. So in some of the countries, there are like families who they, they've been waiting for more than 30 years and they still don't know uh, if the person is dead or alive. 
I will be doing this project in six different countries. And uh, I've done, I, I will show only this part which was uh, done in Lebanon uh, last year, where I photographed 10 families. And what I do is I went, uh, I look for these families and I ask them where they remember seeing the person, uh, the family member who disappeared for the last time in the same house where they are still living now. And I photograph uh, the space. So for, for these families, especially, uh, I mean they, for them, especially, most of them are mothers. They lost either sons or husbands. So for them, it's, life has stopped completely the moment the person disappeared. Nothing has been changed since then. And they are, they are, the only thing they, are, I mean, they expect now is just they want an answer uh, either where the remains are or whether the person is still alive. Because in case of Lebanon, what happened, uh, there were so many militias were fighting uh, amongst each other. And still these men who fought, they are still in, in the parliament today. So nobody uh, is willing to tell where uh, they dumped the bodies. For instance, one of the MPs said, yes, I killed them. And this was on a national TV. He said, yes, I killed them, but I don't know where I dumped the bodies. And another story was also uh, among these people who disappeared, there was a British journalist. And in 2005, after 30 years, they came with an agreement, uh, two governments and also the party who kidnapped this journalist to indicate where the body was buried. So what they did is they dug the and took out the British body, but with the same person, there was another Lebanese. They put it back and they covered. For me, this is, I think so far, it's the most difficult project I've, I've worked on because I'm dealing directly with the families who went through this trauma uh, in person. And the first two days, it, it was, very difficult for me to to uh, to communicate not communicate the communication was quite easy because I, I speak Arabic so we spoke in Arabic uh, that breaks a lot of ice uh, when we first met but uh, I think just to me being there and sitting with these families it, it was so difficult because I couldn't do anything I couldn't tell them where the bodies are and it, it felt, it, it was really strange. Uh, second day I wanted to stop, but then I decided that I should continue doing it. So after Lebanon, there will be uh, also in Brazil, uh, Argentina, uh, South Africa, Bosnia, and uh, probably Spain. Uh, some, some places are more, uh, they dealt with the issue in, in a way that they can talk about it, and some uh, countries, some places, they cannot deal with it. So they are not ready to co uh, confront or, or deal with this issue in any way. And one of them is Northern Ireland. Uh, there are still four people missing, but it was, I mean, I, I, couldn't, uh, I couldn't get hold on any of these families. I think it's still an issue in in Northern Ireland and today. This woman, her husband was a, a teacher. He was communist. So uh, they one day they came and they kidnapped her husband, and she. she she met these two guys who kidnapped them. They told her that we will bring him back, but they never did. And she met them in Canada. When she immigrated to Canada, she met them and uh, they were living in the, uh, on the same neighborhood as refugee, political refugees.
And yeah, this is, uh, uh, the house was here, but the house doesn't exist anymore. This is a uh, military uh, zone. Thank you. I hope I'm allowed to move the move this mic and that it wasn't meant to be sitting there. Um, so good evening, everyone. Um, as Alison mentioned earlier, I'm uh, Omar Khalif, the uh, guest curator of this exhibition. And I want to begin by thanking uh, both uh, Chief Curator Andrea Carnes and uh, Curator um, Alison Hurst for inviting me to propose Herrera's work in the context of this museum, of this state, and of this country. Uh, I lived, have lived on and off in the United States for numerous years, and at the time, actually no, I wasn't living here, but, um, and, uh, and I know the difficulties that arise from showing different kinds of artistic practices having worked in museums in this country. And when thinking about the proposal for this show, I had a very specific idea in mind, which was that you would walk through <clears throat> these collection, these beautiful galleries. I mean, this is one of my favorite museums in the country and built by one of my favorite architects as well. Um, and but you would walk through the museum where largely, uh, that are largely occupied by white male artists, whether or not, that's not a critique of the museum, but that's just how art history skews in the West. You know, so whether it's Anselm Kiefer, or whether it's uh, Andy Warhol, or whether it's Philip Guston, to walk through all of these these histories. Of course, um, the curators here over the years have made adjustments and changes and brought in different voices, but still, there is a pervasive narrative that we are attuned to and that we are taught. But to walk through all of that to the very end, to have these free bays of this Syrian artist's work, and specifically to have the work Final Flight, these free birds taking off into space in front of a projection mapping their final flight, their final route, right across from one of my favorite works of art of all time, the ladder for Booker T. Washington by Martin Poirier, and ladder ascending in the opposite direction to the heavens that pays homage to one of the most controversial African-American figures, felt like a political statement. And all of the work that I do as a curator is political, inherently political, whether I articulate it or not. And I believe that Herrera's work is also inherently political, even if it's poetic, it's lyrical, it's, it's gentle in its approach. So the exhibition that you'll see that opens on Friday focuses on three different bodies of work. Now, you've largely seen ph photographic work, as you'll see Herrera trained in the photographic tradition, um, uh, but I really wanted to show the diversity of his practice. So there is a work in the exhibit, you enter and kind of fall into Execution Squares, which is his most known work, but also this kind of very beautiful f formal work. But as you start to understand and realize what this work is, and you start to see these very ghosts that Herrera talks about appear, it becomes a very different kind of picture. And to your left of that is a film, a film that really tries to consider what it means to think of the concept of home. And then, of course, in the final bay, you have Final Flight, which Herrera spoke about. Um, 
Before I continue, I should also say that I pay my thanks to the Sharjah Art Foundation and our director and president, Houd Al-Qasimi, who uh, enabled, allowed me to, to uh, guest curate this exhibition uh, and who supported part of the production of Final Flight um, and who uh, uh, has also offered me the opportunity to continue to work with Herrera uh, and we will be actually developing a mid-career survey that looks at almost all of his work that will begin in Sharjah in the United Arab Emirates in uh, fall 2021 and then tour uh, Europe. So we're very excited about that. But so enough of talking, Omar. I love to talk. Um, so the title that we came up with together, right? Together. It wasn't just you. It was you and me. Uh, yeah. It was Syria belonging, not belonging. Not longing. No. Was it? No, sorry. Syria belonging, not longing. Sorry. My notes are wrong. Uh, can you reflect on that title and what it means to you? Uh, I mean, it literally means that I don't want to go back, but I still miss it. Uh, it's it's one of these love-hate relationships. We have this saying also in Syria that when you are outside outside of Syria, and this was before the war, when you are outside of Syria, you want to go back to Syria, but the moment you land at the airport, you just want to leave. <laughs> you don't want to stay. Uh, and um, with this idea, it, the, I mean, the title also came an idea that I did uh, like experimental uh, work 10 years ago where I tried to drink alcohol as much as I could just to become drunk and talk uh, whatever, the, 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 talk or say the things that I can't or I don't want to say. Uh, so I did three... Uh, the first three tryouts. The first tryout, I drank one bottle of vodka, and then I was totally uh, drunk, passed out, and accidentally deleted the file from the camera. <laughs> and the second time, I drank again another bottle, and uh, with the help of my friend, who was like, uh, who, who was there next to me, but then I just fell asleep. And the third one that really hit me the worst because I drank one bottle and three bottles of beer and then I got really, uh, I passed out, but they, my friends, we were like 11 people in the room because they really wanted to do this. They filmed me and then the only thing I said is that I don't want to go back. And that, that's how, uh, and I think it's still I have that feeling. I, I miss it a lot, but I just don't want to go back again. So just to clarify, you are not publicly admitting that you're an alcoholic. No. Uh, Herrera and I actually gave up alcohol together for a year last year, so and he's not an alcoholic. But um, this, this idea of, uh, of this title really relates to a concept of displacement. So you are, um, you are Syrian from Damascus, but of Armenian origin, you happen to have recently now hold a British passport, uh, although still you require a visa to enter the United States as Syria is on the uh, banned countries um, on, the, on the watch list, as it were. And you live in The Hague, and if you enter the home studio of the Sarkissian family, you hear a panoply of uh, languages uh, from Armenian, Dutch, Arabic, English, and other gibberishes that I can't put together. And I, I wondered, you know, because there is so much that has been written in post-colonial theory about the concept of the diaspora. Whether for you this idea of, whether you relate to this concept of, do you, do you this concept of displacement or is actually this 
concept of displacement something that you find enabling or empowering in some way? Because you have all of these different kind of languages, tools, facilities at your at your hand. I think we, I mean, as an Armenian minority in Syria, we always felt this displacement, uh, even though we were all born and raised. I mean, I am a third generation. Uh, second generation born uh, in Syria. So we always, even we were born there, we always we always have the idea of motherland, Armenia, that we will go back there one day. Uh, so even now, I, I mean, I'm settled. I, I was settled in London for 10 years, but it's, it's, it's still, it never feels that this is my place. I always think that something will happen and I will, I have to change again. So it, it, I think this idea, it's, it's always, it's been troubling for me too. Like where is, where do I belong? Wherever I go, it's, I, even when I go to Armenia, uh, I don't, I, I feel stranger than I feel more Syrian than Armenian because uh, the Armenian culture, uh, it's so different than the Eastern Armenian, like the current Armenia is, it's so different than uh, the Western Armenia, the diaspora. It's, uh, I think the only thing we share is language and history. But traditions, it's different. Food is different. We, our food is closer to the region, to Syria, Lebanon, uh, than to Armenia itself. So I, I always feel stranger there too. I have so many questions, I must race through them. So uh, we met in 2013 at, the, at Art Dubai. Yeah. Uh, and uh, what did you think of me at that point? Uh, I mean, you just say hello. <laughs> that was it. Yeah, I don't think you liked me very much, is yeah. what I heard, actually. from. It the, was not a love from first sight. No. It was definitely not love at first sight. We never thought we would ever work together, actually. But what was interesting was that Herrera had won this prize, and you did a series of uh, photographs that were in light boxes that were of backdrops of um, uh, photographic studios in and around the Middle East that either were no longer functioning or were about to be destroyed. And one of the things maybe people that isn't evidently clear, because you don't necessarily say it in your talks, is that you only work with a large format camera, not a digital camera, and very much are in, in entrenched in that vein of old school, old time studio photography. But I was curious, what were you trying to do with that project? I mean, in terms of, was it about a restitution of a kind of photographic history? A nostalgia, a longing? Uh, I think it was, uh, I mean, what I did is I photographed 350 backdrops, studio backdrops in five different countries in the region. And the idea was, we can see it as a documenting all these backdrops, but for me it was more the, uh, the disappearance of this profession of uh, studio photography, which it doesn't exist anymore. Uh, I mean, in the West it doesn't. Even, I mean, in the, in the Middle East also it disappeared. And this is something, it was quite important in the society where people, especially when there are festivities, uh, family that just get, got dressed and they went to the photographer to take a souvenir picture of the family. And at the back, there was always these dreamy landscapes, either uh, the Swiss Alps or German Lake. Or, uh, but with the digital age, it completely just disappeared. They did everything with Photoshop. So you cannot dream anymore because it's all uh, whatever at the back. And for me, this was quite painful because I grew up in this uh, culture. Uh, going to a studio and, it, and also Armenians uh, has a lot of history with uh, introducing photography in the region as well in the Middle East, because there were uh, when they were uh, before the genocide, there were a lot of uh, missionaries who came from the states or from Europe uh, to Eastern Anatolia, where uh, there were majority Armenians, and they gave these workshops uh, in craftsmen like shoemaking, jewelry, and photography included. 
So when the genocide happened, it's like it was like a pomegranate. They splashed. They went everywhere, and they started uh, uh, creating or introducing photography because it didn't uh, exist then uh, in the region. And that's how they. Uh, I mean, that's what for me that was the painful part to do this project. I don't know if I've asked you this before, but. I mean, you say in the interview for the uh, in the booklet that that you know you one part of your love of the large format camera is hiding behind the the black curtain of the viewfinder and not knowing what's going to happen. But don't you feel that the digital age has created some context for photography that is important and that should be paid attention to? Uh, I mean, uh, what I miss in the digital, uh, uh, working with digital is I miss this uh, being uh, worried that the picture will not appear. You know, that you don't, there, there is no... Uh, this process of waiting, it doesn't exist anymore. It, it just disappeared. So you just click, click, click. And for me, this is the most important bit also when taking pictures with large format. It's having this pain in your just stomach because and wishing that all the pictures will come up uh, good. As Well, you don't have that with the digital. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I never had a digital camera. I just recently, last week, I just got one just for uh, for one specific project. But I keep working with the large format. But you have an iPhone. I don't use it for work, no. You have an Instagram account. It's just uh, tra trashy. Just, I'm just letting you know that you are take you are making photographs digitally. You just don't seem to realize I do, but when it comes to my work and when it comes... Uh, expressing feelings or putting my feelings in the work, I don't do it with the iPhone. Okay. And this is, wow. I, when I studied in Amsterdam, this was the big conflict between me and my supervisor. He forced me to use phones. And when I did, he said, no, stop. Just <laughs> start, go back. I, um, I'm gonna ask just one more question and then open up to the audience for questions, which I hope you have some. Um, the, uh, one of the things that is uh, uh, quite uh, obvious and quite starkly so is that almost all of your work does not have people in it, uh, except for the f first work that you made, um, the, no, the, the one that you showed us, um, the, your graduation project where your father took your photograph and then Zibiba, which is a, was a, um, another project. But in, in, in all of the other cases, uh, there are no people. And even though you engage with many people at times to make that image, there are never people. Can we talk about that? I, I think, I mean, for me, I like to create this special relationship with me, uh, between me and the image. Because the person, if I photograph a person that, uh, that I don't know, I, I won't have the same sincerity that I will put with the space. Uh, I think that's one of the, it's also the other thing is that for me, having someone in an image, it distracts the, the viewer. So you, you, I mean, if I had someone in this uh, photo, uh, the last project I've done, for instance, it, it will completely take away the whole idea of the phantom uh, of the disappeared person that these families are living with. So uh, yeah, I think, and I, I have the, f yeah, I don't know. I, I mean, even when I work with my dad in the shop, whenever clients came and they wanted to take portraits, I escaped, I disappeared, I asked my dad to take the picture because I, I could never handle uh, that situation. But you did take my passport photo once. Yes, because I know. Uh, um, okay, so if we should open up to the audience. Uh, I don't know, 
we, we don't have a mic, do they just stand up and shout? Uh, Nada, do you want? I have a very loud voice, so <laughs> that should not be a problem. Thank you very much um, for showing us your work, career, and for this uh, conversation. My question actually is about this last project with um, uh, people who disappeared, the one that you shot in Beirut. Have the, you shown these images to the to the to the families themselves? I, I've sent the. Well, I work with an association who uh, take care of these families of disappeared people. So I send the files uh, to them so they can show them. And what do they think of them? Uh, I think they are so much in pain and sorrow, I don't think they think anymore. But I have to admit that they really welcome the idea, uh, uh, the approach that I came up with, because for them it's 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 another way to deliver their message. It's not, uh, because it's been 30 years and for every now and then journalists go uh, from all around the world and do interviews and it's, it's been always the same. And for them, uh, the idea of this project, they, I, I won't say please them, but they welcome the idea because it's different for them too. Yeah, it actually almost becomes a portrait of the absent person. They, yeah, know. that's true because I mean, for them, the person didn't die. And this is the thing that I experienced when I was doing this uh, in, in Lebanon. So every time I said goodbye to the, 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 these mothers, uh, they hugged me. I mean, we only met for one hour, but they hugged me as if I was the one who came, uh, their son came back. And, and this was really, for me, the most difficult also part of the project because, I mean, in Arabic, we can say a lot of words uh, that can please if someone is ill, but there is no word that can uh, fulfill this uh, absence. Uh, one here. Um, my question uh, again is about your last project. Uh, my question is that how did you choose those families? Uh, is it like like a special place that like those families to you or so what I do is uh, of course it's uh, I don't contact families directly because it's really I mean it's uh, if I go to Argentina I don't know anyone in Argentina so what I do is I try to look for associations foundations NGOs who deal with this matter in each of these uh, countries and I try to contact them so in Lebanon it was it was the process was very easy because I knew friends who knew the head of the foundation. So they, uh, he did an introduction and then I met the foundation three times and they arranged uh, these meetings with the families. But in other countries it's more different. For instance in Bosnia it's, it's really difficult to hold on. I've been working on this for, uh, it's been six months, they don't reply. It's one is a question of language because I write in English, they, so they don't uh, reply back. So uh, it's it's quite difficult to reach them. So uh, what I do is I find someone who would like to work on this project with me, and they like the messenger more or less, so they can communicate the locals, and then I fly over and then uh, meet the families and do the project, take pictures. My next question is that. Are you still looking for more families? For because some um, countries which has this uh, situation, uh, the government doesn't want you know someone goes to these families and talk to them. So are you looking for? Um, well, I mean, I, I am. Yes, I'm, I'm looking in six countries. Uh, work. We'll do the project in six countries. Uh, so the, my next uh, trip will be to Argentina. I've been to Brazil. Uh, that was very difficult because in Brazil, what happened is there were, uh, during the dictatorships in the 70s, 80s, there were like 500 people, uh, that these are the official numbers, disappeared. Uh, but the thing is, since, in the, since from 70s until now, uh, Sao Paulo as a city expanded massively. So, so none of these families are uh, residing in the same home where they used to live when the accident this event took place. So we couldn't locate families who are still living in the same uh, uh, house. 
which is one of this is one of the main conditions to do this project. There is a question here. Yeah. First of all, welcome to the United States and welcome to Thank Texas. You. Uh, your work is so deeply considered and so broad in nature in terms of the cultures that you, you're you looking at. I can't help but ask what your thoughts are. If, you, if American history or any of our issues here have piqued your interest. Uh, I mean, to be honest, I lived in London for 10 years. I haven't done any work in the UK. I, I, I think uh, the only work I've done outside of my uh, geographic territory, which was the, the project about the terminally ill people that was done in Holland, uh, because it also, I mean, we, uh, it's about death eventually and we will all die. So that's, I always try to find a sort of a connection between the project and because I also want to be connected to it. Uh, I mean, I, I, I don't want to shut it and say I can't do anything here, but and this is my first visit, so uh, it, I think it's, these things need time and I need to stay and study and research. Um, I had a question regarding the um, Final Wishes project. Um, and you picked 47 places so I was wondering if there's a significance behind the number and um, what, how you went about to picking those places and if there's, if you have the history behind the person who, who yeah. chose this. So the, the number, uh, I mean the selection I did with the help of the foundation, uh, it was 50. So uh, three of them, uh, there were three who didn't happen. One of them is Coca-Cola in the Netherlands. They refused to give me permission. Uh, the second one was a circus that did not exist anymore. And the third one was uh, a woman who has a shop for wedding dress. She rents wedding dresses and she also refused. Uh, that's why how I ended up with 47. Uh, the stories of these uh, individuals, yes, I know. Uh, uh, all of them, but when I show the work, I don't include personal stories uh, because I think it's something really intimate. Uh, <clears throat> so uh, uh, the reason I chose these places because they are public, uh, and s there are people who made wishes, such as the Last Supper with the family, uh, or going to a restaurant, or you know. So I, I try to avoid uh, intimate. Uh, places, uh, so I, I only decided to public spaces. It's also easier for me to get access as well. It's, yeah, it's kind of related to the thing of like, uh, choosing a lot of countries. Or, uh, How do you choose the countries? What is your criteria? Uh, there is no, I mean, there is no crit criteria, but I, I try to expand it that just to tell that this is something that it doesn't happen in one place it happens everywhere and also the idea is that wherever there is war when the war is finished it doesn't mean that it's uh, problems are are finished are done people still uh, suffer from what happened uh, I, I try to just to make a selection from uh, all around but logistically, it's not easy because I started with, for instance, on the list I had Cyprus and I had issues with uh, Cyprus because, because of the, the conflict when first uh, <clears throat> there was the war between uh, Greek Cypriot and the Turkish Cypriot. Before that uh, conflict started, there were like a Greek Cypriot militias who were fighting with each other and they were kidnapping each other. Today, the Greek Cypriot do not admit that this was the case. So I just took the Cyprus out of the list. You know, and, and, yeah, it's, it's more logistic rather than... I could have told you that. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, it was, and it was also very difficult in Northern Ireland. I mean, I remember when uh, uh, we're, we're commissioning this project as part of the show, and, but I've been following it before 
I got in before we were uh, we were able to get involved and um the uh, the time he spent in Northern Ireland seemed very kind of alienating um, and difficult. And I, I think it also has to do with disposition of particular uh, people and a kind of willingness to also share. Uh, so I think that the project as a whole uh, will be very interesting to see, but I'm terrified if you're going to make your deadline, but that's uh, that that's another issue. M miracles happen. Yeah, Th those will actually be smaller prints, right? Yeah, S smaller prints that will kind of be kind of this panoptical view of the, of this idea of disappearance uh, as a global phenomenon that occurs where conflict happens. So we have time for just one more question. Who wants that question? Uh, one, two, three. Okay, how about we do this? Everyone asks their question, question and then he responds. So there's one, two, and three. So first, ask her. Can I ask? Um, are you willing to say anything more about what it was about the ibises that interested you? Okay, we'll take the next question. <laughs> It's not a question, it was a comment. Okay. Go. Go. <laughs> I just wanted to say that my father was a photographer in West Texas. And in the dark room, I shared those same magical feelings that you had watching that image come to life. And I just wanted to share that with you. Thank you. Well, I don't do these magical moments anymore. <laughs> because, I mean, I, I, I did when I was a child, yes. And uh, even when I worked, yes. But now in, in my work, uh, I think it's time consuming and I think the facilities are not available anymore. Yeah. But, the, but, the but I miss these moments, yes. But the magic lives on in your mind. Uh, so, uh, and the last question. So my last question is actually to you, Omar. Oh, okay. So, um, I have seen your work in various places. Uh, my question is if you have a moment, if we have a moment, for you to reflect on guest curator and, uh, curating in other countries and how, um, I mean, you know, you spoke about the poetics of that beautiful museum and the space here, but how do you then um, able to kind of meet other challenges given the fact that you have audiences of, of you know, people that maybe you're not, um, uh, you know, not sure how, do you, how much you know about Fort Worth, Texas, for example, um, yeah. and the, the viewers. But just some reflection on, we don't often get the curator actually to be also present, so, you know, this is a great opportunity to get to hear some of you. Okay. I'll answer. Do you want? Does Herrera want to answer his question first, though? Could Could you please repeat the question? <laughs> I, are you willing to say anything more about um, what it was about the irises that interested you? Uh, well, it's. Uh, I mean, the story of the bird. It's for me. It tricked the. It's kind of has a, a relation with the story of the Syrians during war, and uh, that's where I made this connection. But I don't want to say it's directly about that, but for me it just, it, it, it was uh, the motor to do this project. Uh, I think it's rare that the curator gets the final question, and, uh, but you know, why not? I'm very egotistical. Um, uh, so, um, it's, 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 it's a very useful question uh, to, to ask because I don't know if, if people necessarily even know what curators are. I mean, curators are people who organize exhibitions, but they're also people who create discourse ideas and uh, build relationships of artists and try and get people into institutions that wouldn't be able to, you know, be shown in certain institutions through their relationships, right? And it's a very weird profession. And um, so Texas and Fort Worth, yes, Fort Worth is uh, not, well, I feel like I saw a lot of Fort Worth today because these lovely ladies here, Andrea and uh, Allison, uh, helped me deal with a severe back problem by sending me to two different uh, parts of town. 
Um, so I felt like I saw a lot of Fort Worth. Uh, but actually, it, it, uh, any curatorial project that I do is formed through a relationship. So Andrea and I actually met when I was senior curator and, uh, and the deputy director at the Museum of Contemporary Art Chicago. And um, I had had an interest in Laurie Simmons and had wanted to organize a show and found out that Andrea had already organized one. And so, um, uh, it, you know, asked Andrea if we could take the show to the MCA. Um, and uh, I came here and uh, we developed, and we also went to Lori's studio and we developed a, a relationship uh, and a friendship and also a, a dialogue around particular kinds of art. You know, we both loved photography. We, uh, you know, we, you know, as when I saw the Black Table series by Carrie Mae Weems, one of my favorite works also, upstairs, and then the show that Andrea had curated up here, I just related to her immediately as a human and felt that I could share ideas with her. And um, that's, that's how the door opens. Uh, and then there, as, as, as a curator as in, in her role um, and in Allison's role, they then have, you know, their stakeholders that they have to work with, you know, um, you know, patron donors, trustees, um, director, museum scheduling, gender balance, geographic scope, etc. But, you know, you you did say something to me uh, on my way here, which was that uh, as far as you believe and you've been teaching here, you know, at University of North Texas, you know, at, like Nada, at Professor Nada Shabud who's asking this question is a quite legendary figure, by the way, and wrote, wrote the book, the first book on Arab art. Um, and so it's quite, you know, she's quite major and she lives here in this area. And, um, and uh, you said that this was not the first Middle Eastern show, solo show in the DFW area, but the first Arab solo show in the DFW area, as far as you can recall from the time that you've lived here. Um, that surprised me, but also didn't surprise me so much because, you know, in Chicago, which is all, which is at the MCA, which showed, you know, Okwe and Wazer's The Short Century in 2001, which was the, ex which I saw when my dad was attending a medical conference in Chicago and was the show that turned me to art, you know, was very difficult there to show different kinds of artists from different geographies unless I bought them, brought the money myself from the Middle East. So, you know, it's, it's a very hard job and uh, when I guess curate now it's largely because of relationships because of the places that I've worked but also it's it, it's you know I do think of the context as well and you know like, that's why Herrera show because I thought people here wouldn't be familiar with the work is showing a kind of like uh, the, the, a diverse sense of his practice, but I've spoken more than I should have. So, uh, but thank you. But she's awesome, this woman. You should talk to her, and you should read her. You should read her books, and and I hope they're they're stocked in the modern store. If they're not, they should, because I I've, I invested. I have just invested a lot in that store, uh, which is which is awesome. Texas, the great Texas mem Texan memorabilia in there for anyone. Texan shaped chocolates. It's very very. Very, very good. Um, but yeah, so I just I want to, and I just want to say thank you again to Andrea and Allison, and um, to this museum, uh, to Marla Price, the director, uh, to all of you for coming, and uh, of course to Herrera Sarkisian. Uh, your work has inspired me long before I knew you, and um, and increasingly uh, I and every time I, I I hear you speak, I learn something different. So thank you so much, and thanks for going on this little adventure together. Thank you.